Um, now, I don't know about for you guys this past year, but I'm sure you've had some big things happen uh, in this last year. I'm sure you've had important moments and milestones in your life. And what we tend to do and what I tend to do as we enter the closing part of the year is I begin to look forward to 2024. I begin to look forward to the next year in, uh, in schedules, for personal things, for ministry. Um, but I, I don't often take a time to just stop. For a moment. And so what we're going to do actually for the sermon series for the next two weeks is we're going to stop and we're going to breathe just for a second. That's actually the title of our little mini series. It's called Stop, Breathe. And this is going to be a two-part mini series today and next week. And yes, it's going to continue into next week, which is our combined service with our Korean ministry. And we're going to follow up on what we're talking about today, about how we're going to stop and breathe. The subtitle is probably one of the most boring subtitles I've ever made for a sermon series is A Reflection and Prayer Based on Deuteronomy. But you'll get, we'll get into why we're focusing on the book of Deuteronomy. Now, as we enter into this year, I want to start with a very important biblical concept that comes from the book of Deuteronomy. I want you to listen to what God says to his people in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says this, be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Did you notice the connection between these two verses? The first thing he says is obey, listen, and obey. And then the second thing he says, he explains how we can obey or what can contribute to our obedience. What was it? Remember. Remember. To God, this is really key here, to God, this is important for this little mini series, to God, obedience and remembrance are deeply connected. That if you are able to remember, then that will enable you to obey. And the flip side, if you forget, you are more likely to disobey, or as we just sang in that song, we will be prone to wander if we forget. So the question we have to ask ourselves as we begin this little mini-series is, have you remembered? Have you taken time to stop, breathe, and remember what God wants you to remember? Now, um, we're focusing on the book of Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy is the perfect book for this kind of season in life. For a time of transition where you're going from one spot to the next spot, Deuteronomy is the perfect book because what's happening in Israel's history is Israel is at the end of their wandering in the wilderness. For 40 years they've been wandering and wandering and wandering and they're about to enter into the promised land, this unknown territory that is supposedly really great and full of blessing, but before they go in, Moses has to sit them down and have a chat. And he has a really, really long chat, a chat for about 34 chapters. He says, before you transition, before you move into what you knew, into what you now don't know, let's sit down and talk about some really, really important things to position yourself for success and blessing in the next year. So that's what this series is about. How can we look at the book of Deuteronomy? How can we go through and learn from the book of Deuteronomy, from Moses' and God's teaching in this moment, so that we can be positioned for success and obedience and faithfulness in the next year? And according to what God says here, is it's not about making plans and goals. It's not necessarily about discipline, what's core to that, what, what, is, what is extremely essential to that endeavor is to sit, stop, and remember some important, important things. So what we're doing in this series is we're actually going to look through the entire book. We're going to go through the entire book of Deuteronomy, a really broad, overall look at the, study, at, at the book of Deuteronomy. And what we're going to do is as we look at the kind of breadth of book of Deuteronomy, we're going to design a prayer and a reflection based on Deuteronomy. 
So the way Moses leads his people to pray and reflect and what, what concepts and ideas come from the book of Deuteronomy, we're going to develop a prayer and reflection that I'm going to offer to you and invite you guys to do it later. So here's what you guys need to know. This sermon and next week's sermon, it is not going to blow your mind. Right? No one, I don't think anyone's going to leave this place being like, wow, I've never heard that before. That's amazing. I'm so inspired. You're not. And that's not the point. The point of this is not for you to be inspired as you listen to the sermon. The point is for you to do what I share with you. And in your time of reflection and prayer, God is going to blow your mind. All right? Not me. I'm not going to do it because I'm just going to be sharing what, what it says in Deuteronomy. Like, very, very simple. The mind-blowingness of it happens after. And it's on you, unfortunately. Like, if you go into this time and you take this moment to stop and breathe in your busy schedules before you hit 2024, and you reflect and are led through this reflection and prayer, I feel like in that moment, God is going to reveal some stuff to you, and he's going to speak into your life, and he's going to show you some things, and he's going to guide you, and that's when you're going to be like, wow, 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 the Holy Spirit is moving. Not right now in this moment, but later. So it's essential that you take what you hear in these next two weeks and you actually do something about it. You actually, it's, it's really, really important because that's where the emphasis lies. So with that, let's pray and get into this book. Father in heaven, I thank you, God, so much for your mercy and your grace and your love. Holy Spirit, I'm depending completely on you. This is your time. I pray, God, that you would speak to us in the ways we need to be spoken to, Father. Open our eyes and our ears as we hear your word today and afterwards as we enter into this time. Give us that conviction and commitment to apply this, to do this prayer and spend this time in reflection so that you might speak to us. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Now, as we enter into this message, it's really key here that we understand kind of the overarching view of the book of Deuteronomy. So the book of Deuteronomy, real quick, is split into three sections. The first section is chapters 1 through 11, and that's Moses' first speech. The second, chapter is, uh, the second section is chapters 12 to 26. That's called the second law. These are titles I gave it, by the way. And then the third section is chapters 27 to 30, which is Moses' final speech. At the very end, it talks about his death and stuff like that. So three key sections, Moses' first speech, the second law, and Moses' final speech. And we're gonna work through all of this, and we're not gonna finish today. We're gonna get through about half of it and develop, again, a prayer and reflection to lead us into that based on the concepts and teachings of Moses in these books. So we're gonna start with the first section. So Moses' first speech, chapters one through 11, he starts with chapters one to three, and we'll title this, The Story So Far. So what has happened so far in chapters one to three? It's just kind of a rehashing of their story. But I want you guys to pay attention to what he focuses on at the end of chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. He's talking to the Israelite nation. He says, but you, Israelite people, were unwilling to go up. And he's talking about going to the promised land. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. And then a couple of verses later, he says, in spite of this, which is all his faithfulness, you did not trust in the Lord your God. So Moses begins his talk reminding them of their unfaithfulness. And then immediately after that, he talks about God's faithfulness in response to their unfaithfulness. So as I'm looking at the book of Deuteronomy, I didn't want to start this way. Like who wants to start this way? But, but if we're basing a prayer and reflection on the book of Deuteronomy, we have to understand that this is where actually it begins. It begins with the reflection and remembrance, not of necessarily of God's goodness at first, but actually of your and my unfaithfulness this past year. And that's uncomfortable. Like, we don't like that. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wanted to come here to church, be reminded of their unfaithfulness today. But that's what Moses did. So that's what we're doing. So he begins with, his, with, with the Israelites' unfaithfulness, and I don't have a specific verse because there's no verse in this section where it's like, but God was faithful to you. Instead, it just describes how God never left them. 
and how he continued to lead them and how he continued to guide them and how he continued to protect them. And they would rebel, but he would continue to be there for them. It just gives the story of how God continued to do this. So as we develop this prayer and reflection, we got to begin with this. Our reflection and prayer begins with our unfaithfulness and God's faithfulness. So you have to sit down and take a moment to think about this past year and the ways that we have been unfaithful and the ways that we have sinned and the ways we have been disobedient in our hearts, in our minds, in our behaviors, in our actions, in our decisions. We have to take a moment to think about the times where we didn't trust God and we didn't really give it to him and didn't really surrender. We have to think about and recall those moments when fear got the best of us and we made some decisions that we weren't really proud of. We have to get in those moments, but in those moments, as Moses does, it flows right into the faithfulness of God through all of that. So you think about your unfaithfulness, but at the same time, in that same breath, you remember God's faithfulness through it all. That, yeah, I did those things, but God never left me, and this is how I know he didn't leave me. In this past year, you think about how you were blessed. You think about how, how God continued to guide you through, through troubles and issues. How when you, when you did some things and you deserve some things, that's not what you got. You recall those moments. The unfaith, our unfaithfulness and the faithfulness of God in kind of one moment is where we begin this reflection and prayer based on the book of Deuteronomy. We think about, this is when we think about all the things that we don't deserve. This is when you look at your, your life and the things around you and you think, I didn't do any of this. All of this is from God. This is a blessing. It's in this moment. You know, and this for me is really special. You know, as I think about this past year of, of church and the ministry here, and if you talk to anyone who's been here for a really long time, we, the common theme is like, wow, there's all these people here that we've never been here before. Like there's all these new people, all these new, new faces, all these new friends, all this like the growth in our church has been awesome this past year. And, and as I look at that, it's easy for me to just move beyond it. But for me, I have to sit and think, wow, that is all the mercy and grace of God. Like, we didn't do anything, guys. I didn't do anything. We did not do anything different. We just were us and we just did our best, but somehow God led people. And if you are one of those people, man, we're so grateful that you've been a part of our community. If you've been here for less than a year, man, we're so thankful for you and we're so happy to see you here. Like, we have to sit in a moment to realize that there's so much in our lives that we don't deserve. Maybe you look at your kids or you look at your job or you look at your spouse or you, or you look at your, your current situation in, in your finances and you're like, you know what? This is all a blessing from God. You got to take a moment to recognize that before you move on. And that's all in the context in light of how unfaithful we were this past year. So this is where Deuteronomy begins, chapters 1, 2, 3. That's the story so far. And then in chapters 4 through 11, it is a call to faithfulness. So Moses says, this is how we were unfaithful. This is how God was faithful. Now we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful. And this is how he begins this section in chapter 4. He says, and now, and now, because we talked about all the history. And now, Israel, listen carefully to the, these decrees and regulations that I'm about to teach you. Obey them so that you may live, so you may enter and occupy the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add or subtract from these commands I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord, your God, that I am giving you. It's a call to faithfulness for the next season of life. Now, the key verse in this section, and actually the whole book of Deuteronomy, is found in this section. It's in chapter 6. And it's a famous verse uh, for Jews. It's called the Shema. The Shema. And for those of you guys who don't know what that is, the Shema for the Jews is like John 3.16 for Christians. You know, it's like the verse, right? Like everyone should probably, if you grew up in church, you've heard John 3.16, you probably got it memorized. You may not know what it means, and that's okay. You just have it memorized because everyone knows that, right? So for the Jews, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5, the Shema, that was that verse. And let me read it to you guys. And you're going to notice there are parts of this, this text that you know and have heard in other parts of the Bible. So he starts like this, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. This is where Jesus gets the greatest commandment, 
Okay? So there's more to this, but I wanted to focus on just this part. He says, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So there are key, three key points in, this, in these few verses in the Shema. Okay? And uh, they, they, interestingly, all start with L. Okay? So the first point, as we look at this call for faithfulness in the Shema, is the word listen. Listen, O Israel, Listen, O Israel. Now, what we got to do is we got to understand what listen meant for these people because it's a little bit different than now. See, for, for the, in the Hebrew language, the word for listen, which is actually the word shema, which is where it comes from. This whole thing comes from just the first word of this text. Shema, it does not just mean to receive uh, a communication. It doesn't necessarily mean to just hear. Built into the word for listen, Shema, is also the spirit and the idea of responding. So when, when they said listen, he's actually saying hear and respond. So to passively just listen to words and do nothing is not to Shema. Right, a lot of times we don't Shema. My kids definitely don't Shema. They just listen, they hear one ear out the other, you hear it, you don't do anything about it, that is not Shema, that is not listen. When he says listen, it's a hearing of the communication, but it's also an intended, intentional response to the communication. So what this means is, there's a better English word that we have for this, it's not crazy, but really the sense of Shema or listen is, is obey. So it's this indication that I'm going to hear from you, God, but I'm going to obey. I'm not going to hear and be like, hmm, let me think about that. Let me see if I can fit that into my schedule. Let me, think, let me see how that compares to what I know or what I've heard about other things. No, it's this dedication and commitment to hear from God and do what he says. So he says, obey, 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 O Israel. The second key concept in the Shema is the word love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And again, we have to unpack this and understand that the word love here is different than how we understand and may use the word love. This indicates, yes, a, a positive affection or affinity for something. And we, we often assume that the things that you love, you have a positive feeling, a positive emotional reaction to the things that you love. But this word for love here is much more than just simply a positive feeling towards something or someone. Built into this word, just like Shema, built into that word was the, the, the sense of obedience. Built into the word of love here is not just a feeling, but a decision or commitment. The things that you love are things that you feel positive feelings towards, but you are committed to. So it's different than the way we talk about how we love food or love coffee or love sports teams. It's different. It's, it's, it's a sense of I, I have this positive, really, affinity for something, but at the same time, that feeling, even if it goes away, I'm committed to it. I'm dedicated to it. So in the Shema, it says, obey, listen and respond, obey God and love him. Have those feelings, have those positive feelings towards him. But also, you got to be dedicated and committed to him. So a better English word or a more, a, that gives us a more full understanding of this word is the word devotion. So in the Shema, it's really about obeying, obedience, and being devoted to God. See, I want you to have a, a positive feeling towards the Lord. I want you to have emotions connected to God that when you think about him, when you interact with him, you feel good. I want that. But there are times in life where that does not, is not sustained. And in those moments, you have to have built into your love for God de de devotion, commitment, and dedication. It cannot just be simply how you feel. And so this is the essence of what he's teaching in this section where he's calling Israel to faithfulness. He's really calling them. What that means is he's calling them to obey and to love, to obey and be devoted to God. And the last word or the last key concept is this phrase, the Lord alone. Now, some Bible translations, if you've read this before, it says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. But in this translation, this is the NLT, which I think in this moment actually reflects the original language better. It's the Lord alone. So what he's describing here is that you got to obey and you got to uh, love the Lord alone. So he's describing the uniqueness of God, not in terms of his character, 
but in terms of his relationship to us and our relationship to him. He wants you, he wants the people to obey and love God alone. God alone, the Lord alone. Now, for, for a lot of us, this is like pretty obvious. Of course, like who else am I going to de be devoted to? What other God is there that I will like love and obey? There's no other gods. We, we understand that. Like no one here this week or this past year has been like, should I worship God or should I worship Zeus? Right? Nobody was dealing with that. No one was tempted to worship Vishnu, I don't think, this year. We're not, we're not struggling with, should I worship this God? Should I listen to this God or should I listen to this God? But for the ancient people, you got to remember, this was a very, very real situation. This was a very real challenge because remember, these people, they just came out of Egypt. And in Egypt, they didn't have one God. They had lots of gods. And the way people viewed these ancient gods and the Israelite people viewed these ancient gods was not necessarily that like, oh, this God is true and this God is not true, so I better pick the right one. No, it was you were faithful and obedient and devoted to the God that you desired, the one that fit your needs. So what you would do is like, if you were a farmer, you'd be like, I need rain. So I'm gonna go pray and worship the God of rain. And like, oh, I got rain now, but now my kid is sick. So I'm gonna go and worship and pray to the God of healing, right? So you would just pick and choose as your needs came up. And you could always, you don't have to eliminate gods. All you have to do is add gods. You know what I mean? So, so you have this pantheon, all these gods that you worship depending on what time of life you're in, what season of life you're in, and you worship gods depending on your needs that suited you. And then if a new god was brought up, say, hey, this god is really awesome. You'd be like, cool, let me just add him to my category, my library of gods. And so when the Israelites come out of Egypt under this culture for 400 years, Moses has to say, listen, guys. Now, when you go into this unknown territory, the, the, the promised land, you got to know that you're going to obey, you're going to love the Lord alone. You can't add any other gods. You can't swap them out. You can't just do it based on your needs and desires in that moment. It's the Lord alone. Now, again, this seems kind of like not really relevant for us, but I want us to take a moment to really think about what this is. And we talked about this in a recent series when we talked about idols. We said that idol worship is really self-worship. Because the idol you worship, the only reason you worship that is because it reflects yourself and your needs. So because I am self-centered and I have needs, I will worship the God that will fulfill my needs. And although you may not struggle with, with uh, another deity like, you know, some, some pagan God, you may not struggle with that. But we do struggle with trying to use God to fulfill our needs, don't we? We, don't, we, don't, we? we struggle with saying, I need this, I want this, therefore God do this for me. We treat, we treat God like the ancient Israelites treated idols. And so we have to understand that we are, when we're called to faithfulness, we're called to love, we're called to listen, and we're called to do this towards the Lord Alone. So what does this mean for us? In our prayer reflection, this section of 4 through 11, the call to faithfulness, the first thing we did was we, we, we remembered and recalled our, our unfaithfulness and remember God's faithfulness. The second thing we do is we pray over our future faithfulness. So as you pray for next year, you pray for your faithfulness next year. I've never really done that. I don't know about you guys, but I've never done thinking about the upcoming year or the upcoming season of life, God, help me be faithful to you. Help me love you. Help me listen and obey. Help me be devoted to you no matter how I feel, no matter if I feel great about you, no matter if, if the worship songs are inspiring or not, let me be devoted and committed to you next year. I don't really ever pray that prayer over my future. I pray over my future decisions I pray over my future's, future schedules, but do I sit and pray for my future faithfulness? This next section is the, the, the biggest section of the book of Deuteronomy. It's from chapters 12 to 26. It's called the second law. And as he begins this teaching on the second law, it goes over a ton of things, and we're gonna deal with one part of it, and then we're gonna end, and we're gonna conclude next week. He starts with chapters 12 to 18 focused on worship. 
on worship. And he begins this section as you would understand, as you would expect him to say. This is what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Do not worship the Lord your God in the way these pagan peoples worship their gods. Rather, you must seek the Lord, and listen to this carefully, you must seek the Lord, your God, at the place of worship he himself will choose from among the, all the tribes, the place where his name will be honored. You must seek the Lord, your God, at the place of worship he himself will choose from among all the tribes. You know what this means, what he's saying here? He's saying, don't miss church next year. Don't miss church. It's really simple. He says that right there. So in 2024, don't miss church. All right, so moving on from there, he he talks about worshiping God. And then he moves on to another element of worship. And it's an interesting addition or an interesting integration of concepts when it comes to worship. Because afterwards, this is what he says. There, you will bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your sacred offerings, your offerings to fulfill a vow, your voluntary offerings, your offerings of the firstborn animals of your herd and flocks. There, you and your families will feast in the presence of the Lord your God, and you will rejoice in all you have accomplished because the Lord your God has blessed you. So he connects the idea of worship to tithes and offerings. He connects the ideas of worship to finances, which is like weird because we, we, we can kind of see the connection, but we don't really put the two together. But in this teaching where God and Moses are teaching his people how to worship, he talks about their attendance in, in, in coming together at the temple, but he also includes their offerings and their tithes. And this was really cool. I, I, didn't know, I don't know if you know this, this, but as you have been taught probably, and if you were here for our idol series, we talked about tithe, right? That God required his people to give a tenth of their income back to God, right? Back to the service of the temple. But did you know that every three years, listen to what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 14. At the end of every third year, bring the entire tithe of that year's harvest and store it in the nearest town. Oh, I'm missing my verse. Got, it got deleted. Okay, so what it says here, you just got to trust me, or you look in your Bibles. He says every third year, you take your tithe, you collect it, and you go out and you give it to the poor, is what he says. So isn't that crazy? When, when God is teaching him, this is how you worship me, what is included in that is financial faithfulness and generosity to the poor. Generosity to the poor. So what this means for us, uh, what he does after this is he, he continues to talk about feasts, feasts and celebration and festivals and all that stuff. So if I want to sum all this up in chapter uh, 12 to 18, this is what he says. This is what we're doing for our prayer and reflection. Number one, we remember our unfaithfulness and God's faithfulness. We pray for our future faithfulness. But to do that, we pray over our spiritual slash religious and financial practices. So next year, you pray, God, I wanna be faithful to you, I wanna listen, I wanna love, I wanna obey you and you alone, not myself, nobody else, doesn't matter, I'm gonna trust you and I'll follow you. And the way you do that is you pray that I will be faithful in my spiritual and religious practices. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna read the Bible, I'm not gonna miss church, I'm going to serve. I'm going to pray over the things that I need to do on a day-to-day basis. Faithfulness in those little things because that will lead to future faithfulness. So God, can you please help me next year as I try to restart my devotional life? There's that book that I've been talking about reading for so long that the pastor has told me about, my friends have told me about. i got to read that book. God, can you help me be faithful so I'll read that book this year? Can you help me remember to pray You know, I always forget, you know, before I eat, I'm so hungry and I forget to pray. Can you, God, help me to remember to pray next year? And then you think about your financial practices and how you spend and save and how you live in that that way. And you think about how generous or not generous you've been. You pray over spiritual blessing upon your financial faithfulness. God, I struggle with tithing. I struggle with giving and it was tough. But this next year, can you please help me? Can you unleash that? Can you free me from my my greed and help me to be financially faithful? Can you help me to be more generous to the poor? I know I judge them a lot and I assume a lot about them and I don't think that's how you want me to be. God, can you you please just soften my heart and give me more compassion for the poor and give me ways to serve and give to the poor? These are the things that lead us to future faithfulness. 
And the next one, this is gonna be the last one. In, in chapters 12 to 26, from verses chapter 16 to 18, he has a specific section on leadership, on leadership. And he talks about how if you choose a king, if you pick a king, I want you to understand that your king, if you choose to have one, is supposed to be different than the other kings. He's not absolute. He doesn't have absolute power. You can't give him that kind of power. Instead, this is what I want the king to do all the time. Listen to what he says. He's talking about the, um, the law of God. And he says, you, the king needs to have with him a copy of this law. The law that I'm just telling you right now, the king has to have it besides him every, every single day. He needs to have them with him. And then he says, he has to read it all the time. And this is what God says. This regular reading will prevent him, the king, from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way. And it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. So what does this mean for us? As we're looking through all these sections, I think this last section is really important. That in this time, in this next, it is time of prayer and reflection. It's a time to pray for the leaders of this church and the leaders of this community. And I will be the first one to tell you, I desperately need it. Always. I always, will always need your prayers. Pastor Jonathan, he definitely needs your prayers. We need your prayers. And I'm not just talking about the pastoral team. I'm talking about in, in this time of prayer and reflection, we think about the leadership of this community. Pray over the pastors, yeah, but pray over the elders, the board, the board. Pray over the board. Pray over the, the praise teams and the worship leaders. Pray for the, the volunteers, the Sabbath school teachers. Let's please pray for the Sabbath school teachers teaching the children. Right, pray for them. Pray for the Sabbath school teachers leading the adult Sabbath school. Pray for all the different leaders who are invested. And there's a lot of you guys who are involved. Pray for the leaders of this church. Like We need your prayers. Pray for, for blessing. Pray, pray for success. Pray for vision. Pray for growth. Pray for, all, pray for passion. Pray for protection from burnout and discouragement. Like We need that. You know, as we look into 2024, as we reflect on 2023, we need to take a moment to pray for the leaders of this very, very special, very important and meaningful community. You know, we've experienced lots of blessings here, but you guys probably know that th lots of things can happen in churches that can derail them and, and, and get in the way and, and, and ruin what God is doing in this moment. So we can't just sit here thinking we're going to be fine. We need prayer. I need prayer. Your leaders the Sabbath school teachers, the kids' teachers, they need your prayers. I love how God baked this into this time of reflection for the Israelites. It's like, remember your leaders, pray for them. They need you. They need those prayers. So let me, let me sum up real quick where we got so far. As we looked at Deuteronomy from chapter 1, and now we're at chapter 18. How does God want us to stop and breathe? Where does he want our minds and our prayers to go? First, we start with our unfaithfulness and God's faithfulness. Our mistakes and God's mercy and his goodness. Then we move into a time of prayer where we pray for our future faithfulness, for our spiritual obedience to our, our prayer for, for loving God and listening to God and obeying God and making sure that we obey only him. Right, that we don't, we don't obey ourselves and our sinful desires. That we don't, we don't fall to the influence of other people just because we're worried about what other people are going to think. No, no, we, we, we say that we want to love and be committed and obey God and God alone. We pray over that for next year. And in order to accomplish that or experience that, we pray over our spiritual and religious, but also financial practices for 2024. That our spiritual habits are are. are daily Bible reading or our prayer, our service, our giving, all that stuff that we would be faithful specifically in those things. That we would, we would be able to, in those moments, we wake up Saturday morning and we don't want to go to church and we had a rough week in those moments that the Holy Spirit would work on us and work in us and get us out of bed and get us into church and into community. That maybe in this next year, we'll, we'll make a decision to finally join a small group or finally lead a small group. Maybe that's where God is leading us. But we're going to pray over the details and the small day-to-day -day things that we can do to be more faithful to him. We're going to pray over those things. And we're going to pray for our hearts that we might be more compassionate to the poor and that we might give to the needy. And then finally, 
for this first part, we take a moment to pray for the leaders of this community. We pray for the pastors, elders, boards, volunteers, worship leaders, AV team. We pray for the leaders because they are doing a lot to make this place a place where we can all come and find Jesus and experience the Holy Spirit. You know, I know that a lot of you guys are involved and you do stuff, and I hope you guys know that there is so much involved in leading a community like this. There is a lot. There is a ton, and we need your prayers so that God will continue to bless and guide us into 2024, 2025, 2026. Because the way I see it is the way I look at our community, there is so much that God can do in this place with these people. And so we call for your prayers for the next year. So we're halfway through. We're halfway through of this prayer of reflection and, 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 and prayer for the upcoming year. Now next week, we're going to focus on the second part of the second law. And it gets really, really interesting. Because what he does is he begins to talk about marriage. He talks about family. He talks about jobs and businesses. And like, get this. I didn't realize this, but he even talks about, he even talks about use of the bathroom in Deuteronomy. He talks about how to go about relieving yourself in this community, right? He gets even there. And so how are we going to learn about how to reflect for next year from those kinds of things? That's what we're going to get into next, next week. And then he talks about, then Moses gives his final message before he dies. His last words to the people of God before he dies. And he has some powerful, powerful stuff that we're going to incorporate in this. And at the end of it, we're going to compile this, this reflection and prayer and I believe in that moment as you pray and as you reflect in the ways and you remember in the ways that God wants you to remember, it's going to blow your mind and it's going to lead you into where you are supposed to be next year. And the whole point of this is so that by doing this, we might position ourselves. We might posture ourselves. We might be right in the right place for God to lead us into greater obedience and faithfulness next year. So join us next week. Our service is one hour early next week because we we're doing a combined service with the Korean ministry as we look into how God wants us to position us, how he wants to position us for 2024. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we went through a lot of material here, God. There's a lot of texts and a lot of scriptures we went through here. And God, for me, I feel challenged because I felt like you were leading me in places that I didn't really want to go. You're, you're putting me and, and, and guiding me into prayers I never really thought about. But God, I pray, Lord, for in this moment that we would make a decision that when, it, when this is all said and done, that we would take the moment, take the time to stop, take the time to breathe, take the time to remember and recall and pray for these very, very important things that we might be positioned and prepared for greater faithfulness in 2024. Thank you, God, for each person here for the way you've spoken to us, lead us into faithfulness. In your name we pray, amen.